Hey guys, Pro1701 here, and today we're going to be ranking each doctor's fourth story from worst to best. Now this is a series I've kind of been doing because I think it takes a doctor's first five or six stories before you really get a feel for that doctor, for them to kind of hit their stride. And everybody, you know, ranks a regeneration story, and everybody ranks a post-regeneration story. But when I was thinking about each doctor's second story, I realized no one had ever done that. So I did a video talking about each doctor's second episode, which you can find up here, which I actually liked. I, I realized really quickly I liked most doctor's second stories. And then I thought I enjoyed that. I've never seen anyone rank, you know, their third story. So I decided to do a video ranking each doctor's third story, which were hit or miss, as you can imagine. And you can find that one. Uh, up here as well. I'll also have links probably at the end of the video for those. Um, and so I decided to do each one's fourth story. I'll probably do a fifth story eventually. I figured the first, you know, the second, third, fourth, and fifth will really get you through it. So I wanted to rank each doctor's fourth story. The main reason I wanted to do this was when I got to the top two. Because it, it really clicked in my head when I was looking over which stories were each doctor's fourth stories. And I realized my number one and my number two we're going to be almost impossible to decide because they are both epic stories, essential stories, iconic stories, and something in both stories every Doctor Who fan has to see and needs to see. Um, and the fact that I knew it was going to be almost impossible to pick between them is the reason I knew I had to do this list. I had to challenge myself and to be able to explain why I could or couldn't pick them. And I did finally choose between them. It was it's one of the most difficult decisions I've ever had to make ranking something in Doctor Who because both of the stories are just phenomenal masterpieces of Doctor Who. But we'll get to that. But we're going to start at the bottom of the list. And when I say we're starting at the bottom, we are starting at the bottom with one of the worst stories that's ever come out in Doctor Who. Ever. And that's number, well, I guess technically it'll be 12. There's not an 8th Doctor one because I just haven't seen a lot of the 8th Doctor stuff. I haven't really heard much of his audio. So there's only going to be 12 places. And then 12th place at the bottom. Arachnids in the UK. Oh my goodness. Utter garbage. Complete and total Garbage. Is there anyone that will really try to defend this story to me? Total shite. Garbage. 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 Everyone involved in this just seems to be an, a moron. The, whoever wrote it, whoever directed it, the people in it, especially the doctor. This is another, this is like the modern who version of Kenda. There's a lot of stupid going on here, and the Doctor is suddenly an idiot that makes decisions that don't make sense. Much like Kinda. It's something about the blonde-haired Doctor sometimes, maybe. Um, you know, her thing about, No! You can't shoot that spider and give it a quick death! How dare you! Instead, we should let it suffocate slowly. That would be the humane thing to do. Uh, doctor, didn't you just kill a bunch of the babies like two minutes ago by blowing them up or something or another? Are you really the one to be given moral lessons here? Which is it's awful because you can do a good Doctor Who story about spiders, supposedly. I don't know if they have yet. I think they've done a decently good one with Planet of the Spiders, which to be honest is still a little disappointing, but it's, it's, it's good. It's not great, but it's good. Kill the Moon sucks, and this one sucks. Maybe Doctor Who should just forget about spiders. Hmm. But yeah, this one, total garbage. Nothing redeeming about it, for the most part. There's a couple of little sequences, like when the dude gets dragged away in the bathtub, maybe. That's kind of neat. Or when you see people just hanging by their feet. But for the most part, yeah, pretty garbage. Number 12 on the list, continuing with more garbage. We have Listen, and my thoughts is I don't want to listen to it or watch it. Listen is more garbage. One of Capaldi's worst episodes, while sadly not being his worst episode. Listen is one of those, I enjoyed it on first viewing all the way up till the ending. 
And this is probably the first instance I can think of when it suddenly becomes the Clara show. And it's all about Clara taking over and the Doctor being her plucky sidekick. Uh, the ending to listen is one of the most frustrating things in all of Doctor Who. I think it irks me even more than the Timeless Children does. It just makes me want to scream at the television. And it's nothing against Jenna Coleman. She's a fantastic actress. It's just the, the direction they t chose to take Clara with Capaldi from this episode on. Uh, it's just frustrates me where so many times he feels like her sidekick. I still say the first female doctor was played by Jenna Coleman. And, and that, that ending to listen just mm, yeah, I hate listen. I hate it a lot. We're moving into stories I like now. It's just those bottom two I think are garbage. Everything else from out here up I think is good or better. And that's Aliens of London and World War III, which of course is Christopher Eccleston's fourth story. I enjoy this two-parter. I like it. I, it, I don't go back and re-watch it as much. It's not perfect, but it has a lot of moments I enjoy in it. I like the Slovene. I think their design kind of harkens back to classic Who design, which I enjoy. Eccleston has some great moments in it. I love Harriet Jones. I love... Eccleston being separated from like Rose and the fact that Rose is, you know, Jackie, Jackie and Mickey get chances to really shine in this episode. You know, I love the whole joke about Rexicorcophalopatorius. I love that name, Rexicorcophalopatorius. I love that. Something about that. Um, I had a girl I dated and one of the reasons we started dating was we both liked Doctor Who. And the reason we found that out was I said Rexicor. I was making a joke about, oh, my name is, and I said this really long thing, I said, but for short, you can call me Rex the Corcophalopatorius. She turned around and said, I know what that reference is from. And we got to chatting over that, and we ended up dating for over a year. So little things like that. Um, I really, really uh, enjoy just some of the humor in this, but it has those serious moments, too. Uh, I like Harriet Jones a lot. The farting thing's a little weird. But it's fine. I like the guy playing the Sladine that's like the vice prime minister or whatever, the larger guy. I like him. He does a really good job in this role. And I like the, the woman, Sladine, the one that shows back up in Boontown. I like her in this. She does a really good job. I like this one. It's good without being great. I just, it's not one I go back to, but I've always enjoyed it when I've watched it. Marco Polo. Now, I have never listened to the whole recon, but I have watched the 30-minute cut down. And so I feel that's good enough for me to put it on this list, because I did like the cut down. The pictures for it worked really well. It gave me the gist of the story, at least. And I did enjoy the 30-minute cut down. I can say that. It's one of those I really wish they would find it, at least part of it, but I'd love for them to find the whole thing, because it really does strike me as a very epic adventure. Looking at the behind the scenes photographs, it looks like they really put some money into it. I like a lot of the costumes and stuff. So I, I really would like to see all of Marco Polo one day, since it is one of those stories, you know, you expect there to be some copy of it out there somewhere. Cause I know there was several copies of it made more so than some of the other missing stories. So um, yeah, I enjoyed the 30 minute cut down of it. Is the Time of the Angels two-parter, uh, what, with Flesh and Stone, I think it's part two. I like part two more than I like part one, but they're both good. <coughs> I like the start, the parts that start on the ship. It's pretty cool. Um, it's nice having River Song back. Uh, I enjoy her with this. Again, it's still early days for Matt, so I like the fact she still kind of knows more than he does here. Uh, I enjoy when they get on the planet. I love her little thing about, I'm an archaeologist. I dug you up. I enjoy that. And now she just escapes. Uh, and then the TARDIS catches her in space. Yeah, I, um, I enjoy this one. I love when they realize all the statues they've been seeing aren't normal statues because the race that used to live there have two heads. And you see them both kind of make that realization at the same time. The doctor's just like, because oh. that seems like very the doctor he's so smart and so intelligent but there's so much he knows that some of it kind of gets lost like Tennant said one time oh I'm so thick I, you know it's like I got so much stuff in my head I need a bigger head you know 
Uh, I love, that's a very doctor thing to do. I love those moments when the doctor has a very doctor moment where he just forgets something that he shouldn't forget, but there's just so much in there that he can't pull. You know, it's like he's got an index catalog, but it's not organized very well, which is also very the doctor. So I love that moment when it, it takes him that long to go be like, oh. <laughs> now I don't like everything, the whole angel in Amy's eye and anything that's an image of an angel becomes an angel. I never really cared for that. Uh, I do like part two. I do like the fact that weeping angels can kill you and talk with dead Bob's voice. That's pretty neat. I like the way he tricks them at the end and shoves all of them in the crack to temporarily seal it. It's a good adventure. It's not nearly as good as Blink, but it's probably their, my second favorite outing of theirs. Although Village of the Angels would be a strong contender if it wasn't tied into flops, because I do like Village of the Angels. As a standalone episode, it would have been really good. That's just kind of where Time of the Angels falls for me. I like it, even though, again, I don't go back and rewatch it a lot. Number seven on the list. Now, numbers four, five, six, and seven were the hardest parts to do. A lot of time when I'm doing ranking lists, the top ones are easy to do, the bottom ones are easy to do, because I know the ones that go on the top, I know the ones that go on the bottom. It's that middle area when you have trouble, like when you're ranking the doctors, when you're ranking the logos, when you're ranking the music, when you're ranking the masters, all of that, the middle ones are always the ones where you're like, hmm. <laughs> and, and then that's the same thing here. Four, five, six, and seven, are like, we're talking a razor's edge difference between them. They're all, it's almost a four-way tie. And if you ask me tomorrow, they could completely flip around. And the reasons why one might rank higher than the other isn't because necessarily the story is better, but it might be some other aspect, which I'll touch on in just a moment. But they're almost a four-way tie. I just want to make that clear. These middle four were really hard to organize. But number seven is Dragonfire. Now, if you watch my channel regularly, you know I like Dragonfire. I'm a big fan of Dragonfire. It's Ace's first story. I love Ace. I love McCoy's Doctor. I think uh, McCoy's era is probably the most underrated era in the show's history. I really enjoy it. I like the set design. I love having Sabalon Glitz back. I've always loved Glitz as a character. Tony did such a fantastic job playing him, and I'm so glad he got to interact with two different Doctors. I love the fact that the alien, which is kind of a knockoff of the alien from Alien, actually turns out to be a benign creature in a nice little twist. Uh, I love the actor playing Kane does a pretty good job. I love the fact you have, uh, what's it, Patricia O'Quinn, is that her name? From the Rocky Horror Picture Show in it. I love the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I love anything with Tim Curry in it, just about. I love Tim Curry. But I love the Rocky Horror Picture Show, so it's nice having her in this. She's great in this. Uh, and then Kane's death at the end, which is straight out of Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's a pretty, pretty good effect for classic Doctor Who, let's be honest. Pretty graphic. So I, I really enjoy a lot of what goes on in Dragonfire. I think it's a really well acted, well made. Yeah, the literal cliffhanger is awful. If they had done it like they were going to do originally, where you actually understood, you know, it actually gave a reason why he was doing it would have made more sense. But him just doing it for no reason and then, uh-oh, it is bad. But other than that, I love Dragonfire. Now, number six, number six on the list is The Visitation. Because I really enjoy The Visitation. Now, I actually think I like Dragonfire story-wise better than The Visitation. But, The Visitation has a couple things going for it that puts it slightly higher. One, the location work looks so good. Because, because the film elements survive for season 19, that anytime you're seeing the location stuff, it looks amazing. It looks so good. You can see when they cut from a location scene to a studio scene. Even on my you know, 720p HD TV, you can see the difference. And it looks great. So part of that is just the location work looks so good. Part of it is that one guy who's kind of the bandit Robin Hood-like guy with the two pistols. I like him. The actor playing him is great. I love him in the story. I like watching him. He's one of the reasons I like going back and watching The Visitation. Um, 
It's not perfect. The robot is... Well, let's just say this story was very obviously made in the 80s. There's no getting away from the fact this story was made in the 80s. The robot is like, hi, I'm made in the 80s. I never really got into the robot design. Um, but I think the cast are doing well. I think Adric, Nissa, Tegan, and Davison are all doing good. I think they're all performing well in it. I enjoy the story. The lizard costumes aren't the best, but they aren't the worst. They're okay. Uh, I like the fact that one lizard does have some scratch marks from the opening scene, like when the people who live in the house are shooting at them. You can kind of see some damage when it took some shots. That's pretty cool. I like that. And I like how it ties in with the historical fire at the end. That's pretty neat. So I do enjoy the visitation a lot. Number five on the list is the Moon Base. I love the Moon Base. I'm a huge Patrick Troughton fan. The Moon Base is easily one of my favorite Cyberman stories. I think objectively the invasion is a better story, but I do like the Moon Base a lot. I don't like everything about it. Like I don't really care for the design of the Cybermen in it. And there are some model shots of their spaceships where you can see the wires. <laughs> It's not perfect, but I enjoy it. It's easily my favorite portrayal Troughton does of the Doctor. He is just, I mean, he's always good. I've never seen Troughton not be amazing as the Doctor. He's always amazing as the Doctor, but this is like my 11 out of 10 or 35 out of 10. He is just on it on this one. And these two surviving episodes and even the animated episodes, the audio he does, it comes through just how on it he is in this story. And the animation is good too. The animation for episodes one and three is one of the two best. I think the best animations we've gotten so far have been Macro Terra and the Moon Base. You know, the, the Macro Terra being basically the best post-power style animation and Moon Base being the best of the pre-Power of the Dalek style that Planet 55 did so well. I love the animation in this. It really gets their likenesses down really well. And even some of their mannerisms, like that smile Troughton does so well. Uh, but the surviving footage is just, those surviving episodes are so amazing. With episode two having one of my favorite cliffhangers in all of Doctor Who and quite possibly my favorite Troughton performance in there. When he gets so panicked, did, did your men search in here? Did they search in here? I love the way Troughton does that the sense of urgency he conveys in his face, in his man, his body language, and in his voice. That is a sign of a good actor when your when your facial expressions, your body language, and your tone and the words you're saying are all in sync perfectly in character. Uh, he just blows it away. He's such a phenomenal actor. Um, I absolutely love the Moon Base, and he's a strong part of that. A strong, strong part of it. Uh, number four on the list is Mark of the Rani. And again, four, five, six, and seven could shift around on any day. You know, Mark of the Rani could go from fourth to seventh tomorrow. I like Mark of the Rani. My first watch through of it was earlier this year when the season 22 box set came in. I'd never seen it before. And I really enjoyed that first watch through. I loved the location work. I love the incidental music in this one. I really, really enjoy the incidental music, which is interesting wasn't since it wasn't the original commissioned incidental music because the guy who was writing the original music passed away and they just started from scratch with the guy that got to do it afterwards. But it's really good. It's really good instrumental music. Uh, I love Kate O'Mara as the Ronnie in this. She's really good. I, I love her in Time of the Ronnie as well. Kate O'Mara is just amazing. She's so good in this. I like Anthony Ainley in this. I enjoy Colin in this. Colin has one of my favorite moments in this and he does it without saying anything. It's when he's hiding in the Ronnie's TARDIS and he's overhearing the master and the Ronnie talking. And then they leave because they don't know he's there. And he walks up to the console with like a screwdriver in his hand. And he just gets this most mischievous little grin on his face. Like, you know he's going to sabotage something. He just looks at her TARDIS console and he's like... <laughs> and it's just like, it's like a five-year-old who knows he's about to do something he shouldn't do. <laughs> and I love it. It's one of my favorite Six Doctor moments. Just that grin he gets on his face is perfect. 
And I love it. And I'm so there for it. <laughs> yeah, I, I enjoy this one a lot. I, um, I really like this story a lot. It's really good. And number three on the list is School Reunion. I love School Reunion. It's a great way. I think it's the first time when you really see the modern show really tie in with the classic show. Bringing Sarah Jane back. Bringing K-9 back. And bringing that connection that the Doctor and Sarah have together back. And it does it so well in this story. One of the, my favorite things I've ever heard is uh, my favorite Doctor Who reactor is uh, Jess from Seska Says. I love her reactions. And I love the fact that she not only has done Modern Who, but she's going back and watching Classic Who. But I remember her talking about School Reunion, and she's mentioned this more than once, where even though she hadn't seen Classic Who when she watched School Reunion, she was able, just from this episode, to get the history these characters have and that they've had and that they share and the bond between them and how close they were. You're, the fact you're able to get that without having seen the classic series, without having seen them together previously, the episode does such a good job at how it's, how it's written, how it's directed, and how David Tennant and Elizabeth Slayton play their characters, that you get that bond and just how close they were. <coughs> I, I've always loved the fact that she got that from her first viewing of that. And she's referenced it in other videos as well. And I, I agree. I think you don't have to have seen Classic Who to get just how important these characters are to each other and how port, important a moment this is for the show, because I'm pretty sure people who were watching the show, who were aware of that the previous series existed, even if they hadn't seen it, they they realized that there was an old show. You know, they understood the fact, hey, this is a character from the old show. And then you start to get just how close they were. It does a really good job of that. I love the creatures in it. Uh, some of the CGI hasn't aged the best, but you know, if I can forgive some of the effects in Classic Who, I can uh, forgive the effects here. Um, I love the fact that you have uh, the guy from Merlin who played Uther, who also played Buffy the Vampire Slayer as the headmaster. I like him. Anthony, Anthony Head, is that his name? I like him. He's really, really good in this. Uh, he, he plays the part perfectly. I love when him and the Doctor are interacting together because there's almost a type of mutual respect there, almost like, a, uh, like they're trying to solve things diplomatically, maybe testing the, or maybe just testing the water, seeing the boundaries each other has. I love the fact that Tennant's still kind of, you know, he hasn't quite softened up yet here. You know, he's like, you know, if I don't like it, it will stop. You know, you get one warning, that was it. I love those lines. Tennant is still very much suffering from the scars Eccleston suffered from. He hasn't softened up here. He's not, you know, no second chances. <laughs> so I enjoy a lot of that exchange. I love seeing K-9. Some of the shots of K-9 using his laser are really cool. Like the one overhead shot where it pans when he's firing is a really cool shot. You know, K-9 sacrificing himself to blow up, you know, the school to save everyone. That's a touching moment for someone who grew up in the classic series who loves K-9, you know. I love the fact he builds her a new one, of course. But that's still a touching little moment, even if it is, you know, even if it's not the same K-9 that we mostly saw in Classic Who, of course. You know, the K-9 Mark III. But still, it's, you know. And, uh, you know, kind of seeing the conversations between the Doctor and Sarah. You could have come back, you know, I couldn't. It's some very touching moments. I love their first interaction when she sees the TARDIS. When Sarah Jane finds the TARDIS. That whole, the way that camera shot works when she backs out and the camera spins around. And you see him standing behind her with that enigmatic look on his face. That's a wonderful camera shot. And then that conversation afterwards, that exchange between them is just phenomenal. It's such a well-written episode, such a well-directed episode, such a well-acted episode. And while series two is very much a mixed bag, it definitely has its strong moments. And this episode is one of those. And the top two. 
the top two are two of the best Doctor Who stories ever made. Ever made. And they're both stories every Doctor Who fan needs to watch. And that, of course, is Inferno and Genesis of the Daleks. How do you rank these two stories? How do you put one above the other? That is, this is literally the hardest thing I think I've ever had to do in a ranking video on these channels, on this channel. Because to me, they're both masterpiece, top, you know, top tier, top 10 Doctor Who stories ever made. And every Doctor Who fan needs to see them. You know, one of them, of course, is one of the stories I have earliest memories of with Inferno. But I also saw Genesis, you know, in my teens for the first time. Um, so I saw both of them when I was young. And I, I, it's so hard to pick between them because they're both essential. They're, they're both important. Um... And it became very difficult. And this is what convinced me I had to do this list is because I need to be able to rank them. And that's what motivated me to finally do this one. Um, how do I pick between Inferno and Genesis? Which one is one and which one is two? I could take the easy way out and call them a tie because they practically are. They're both some of the pinnacle of Doctor Who. And it's like when I meet people who only watch the modern show, for whatever reason, they can't get into the classic show. These are two of the first stories that come to mind. I'm like, you need to see these so you can understand, you know, good Doctor Who. The classic series did some of the best Doctor Who stories ever made. The modern show has also done some of the best stories ever made. I'm not trying to insult that. The modern show has done some amazing Doctor Who stories. But the classic series did several of them, a lot of them. And these are two of the best of the best. And I, I find neither of them drags. I know some people will say that Genesis might drag in the little, a little in the middle, I rather. I can't talk today. Some people might say Genesis drags a little in the middle. I disagree. I don't think it does. Um, but there's still the omnibus version of it, if you prefer that. Uh, if I had any parts that kind of, where my mind might start to wander, is some of the stuff with Sarah Jane when she's separation, separated with the, mudo, the, the mutants, for whatever they're called, the mutos, I forget. Um, I will admit I don't find those parts quite as interesting. But I still wouldn't want to watch the omnibus, I'd rather watch the whole thing. And then there's Inferno, which is seven parts, but I'm gonna be honest, I don't think Inferno drags anywhere. Inferno is living proof to me that you can do a Doctor Who story that's longer than four parts and even longer than six parts, and it's still balanced perfectly. I feel like Inferno is balanced perfectly. It has so many different things going on, so many different balls it's juggling, and it never misses a beat. It never nearly drops the ball. It is perfect with all of its different little plot points between the parallel worlds. This one has this going on. This one has this going on. The doctor's still trying to get back to this one. Then he has to get back to this one. Everything feels balanced perfectly. Um, I can't even pick on essentialness because while Genesis is probably slightly more essential, I think everyone has to watch Genesis. I also think everyone has to watch Inferno. I think they're both essential. I think Genesis might be a little more essential just because <coughs> Genesis is kind of one of the quintessential Dalek stories and it's the Daleks, you know, which is kind of Doctor Who's number one villain, really. You know, it's the story that introduces Davros. I still, to this day, think it's the best performance of Davros. I like, Ju I like all the actors who have played Davros. I do. I think Julian is really good, but I still think no one has ever topped Michael Wisher in Genesis. I think this is the best Davros has ever been written. I think it's the best he's ever been performed. And the interactions, every time Tom Baker and Davros are interacting, is gold in this story. Gold. It does such a good job of introducing Davros that I can see why, even though he dies in the story, I can understand. And there's always that part of me that wishes he would have died in the story, like, permanently. It would have been, like, you know, the perfect ending for him to come up with. But it's easy to see why he came back, because he's such a fantastic villain. And then, you know, the, the Daleks had always had, you know, parallels with 
well, let's say World War II Germans, just because YouTube doesn't like that word. So let's say World War II militant Germans. Uh, you know, they'd always had those parallels, but Genesis really dives into that. Like it doesn't leave any doubt, you know, with their outfits, with their mannerisms. And a lot of that is down to the actor who plays Niner. He just comes across as that, that, that style of World War II militant German demeanor that he has. And that almost fanatic, I don't mean fanatic as in like outwardly fanatic. Because he's a very, he's very calm. He doesn't really get fanatical vi visually. He's a very calm and cold. But the fact that kind of devotion he has to Davros, even when Davros starts doing very obviously bad things, he has that kind of fanatical devotion to him all the way through, all the way through, is very reminiscent of some people in Germany at that time. You really see that in this story. And again, the actor playing him, who's in several other Doctor Who stories. I know he's also in Doctor Who and the Silurians, and he is also in Invasion of the Dinosaurs. He's always good when he's in Doctor Who. But I definitely think Niter is his best role. But he just, the way he performs that character really helps sell the story. Tom Baker is amazing in this story. He has some truly defining moments as the Doctor. Again, his interactions with Davros, um... And of course, his Do I Have the Right speech, one of the Doctor's most character-defining moments in all of the show. Uh, the fact that even he hesitates to kill the Daleks because that would be genocide and that's not a thing the Doctor can tolerate. So, uh, it's so iconic. I love the location work. I love the idea of a group of people who have been fighting for so long that they're in a war that's older than they are. It's like a multi-generational war that's been going for centuries. Imagine being born into this war and it's all you've ever known. That's It, it kind of reminds me of the Prothean from Mass Effect in Mass Effect 3, Javik, you know. They're, they're asking him about science questions because the Protheans were supposed to be this great race 50,000 years ago, but he doesn't know. He's a soldier. You know, this is a war that he'd been in for since people had been in for centuries. So all he knew was how to be a soldier. And it's a lot like these soldiers here. One of the things I loved the most about Genesis was that it kind of dispelled this myth about the Thals and the Daleks during their war. And it was always, you know, the Thals were always kind of painted as the good guys, the one, you know, the ones who wore the white cowboy hats, whereas the Daleks were the bad guys, the ones who wore the black cowboy hats. But Genesis is neat because you really see that it's more of a gray area between both races, the Thals and the Kalas. There's good Thals and there's bad Thals. And then there's bad Kalas, but there's also good Kalas. You know, you have the one scientist who saves the Doctor right when the Dalek M3 whatever is about to exterminate him and Harry. And he's like, no, and he switches the machine off. And then you have like Gorman, you know, who's trying to stop everything from happening. So there, you know, it's neat to see that there are good and bad people on both sides. That it's not just this clear cut, this side is the good guys, this side is the bad guys. It's a much more gray area, more like what we see in modern TV shows now, where nobody's completely good, no one's completely bad. It's kind of a, a mix, you know, more re realistic type of war, the way things are probably in most real wars, to be honest. Most. Um, and that's really fascinating to me. I really enjoy that. But if I had to pick, I would put Genesis second. And I would put Inferno first. Because as much as I love Genesis, Inferno to me, again, is just one of my... It's, Genesis is not my favorite Tom Baker story. City of Death is my favorite Tom Baker story. Whereas Inferno is my favorite Pertwee story. It is the essential Pertwee story for me. I'm not saying it's John Pertwee's Pertweeest story to ever Pertwee, because that would probably be a season eight story, you know, with the master and unit and all that. But I love Inferno. I, again, there, I, it has no real flaws to me. I mean, what can I nitpick about it? Okay, the, the primoid's teeth look fake. That's about it. The primoid's teeth obviously look like not real teeth. It's really the only complaint I have, and I don't really care for Carolyn John's wig. It looks like she's wearing 
when she's our universe is a Carolyn John, that little redheaded wig. I didn't, that looks like a wig, and I didn't really care for it. I actually prefer the uh, alternate universe Liz in this story, which is funny because Carolyn John also also preferred the alternate universe Liz in this story as well. She liked getting to play that character more, found it more interesting. So I love I love that we both feel the same way about that. Uh, I love Inferno. It never drags. I love everything going on with the primoids, you know, the werewolf creatures. I love the actor playing Stallman. I like him because he, he it doesn't feel, he doesn't feel like a two dimensional character to me. He feels very fleshed out. You know, it's his life's work. I get that. I get why he's so anal about everything that he's anal about in it. Is because you know it's his life work, and I like the fact that. When he gets infected, you see it toying with his mind, not just, you know, it changing his hand, you see it affecting his mind, you know, about like the temperature changes, why he becomes more insistent on the drilling. It's like, and he doesn't even realize it's affecting his mind. It's like taking parts of his personality and amplifying them, you know, his haste, his, his frustration, his not wanting to listen to other people and just kind of makes them worse, kind of tweaks what's already there. And I like that. I enjoy getting to see Benton kind of be bad Benton because it doesn't seem like a lot of difference. It's just like, what if Benton had been raised in a somewhat harsher environment? You would have had bad Benton. And then getting, see, getting to see bad Benton turn into like the werewolf thing. That's cool. I enjoy a lot of this story. I really do. John Pertwee puts in a fantastic performance. I love listening to him squabble with the brigadier at the end. And then when it ends up in the trash heap, my dear fellow, are we going <laughs> to, he tries to make up with, you might even don't mind getting a couple of chaps to help me pull the toilet. <laughs> I love the fact that that's the last shot is Liz kind of laughing about it. I love Inferno. If there's ever a John Pertwee story that you should watch, it's Inferno. I love it. I have the original release. I've never actually gotten to see the special edition, which has been cleaned up and looks better. I've only seen... Uh, you know, the way it looked in the 80s when I saw reruns on PBS and then the original release. So even without seeing it touched up with the color restoration, I still love it. I think I think I have the special edition on my Amazon wish list, you know, just, just saying. Um, but I love everything about it. The location work looks good. The studio work looks good. I like the guy who's kind of playing the guy who's supposed to be there to advise Stallman. But nobody ever listens to him. I think he's like an engineer or something. The guy playing him, Sutton, is that his name? Sutton? He's really good. He's really, really good. I like him in this a lot, too. Um, everyone just seems really well cast in this story. I really, really like it. I love some of the stunt effects, too. Like when a guy has to fall down from up top. I enjoyed that. And it's got... Um, I can't. The guy who plays Sir Keith, I think he's the same guy who plays Jago and Talents of Wing Chiang, and then he also was in Unicorn and the Wasp. It has him in it, and I like him. I love when he shows up in the story. I like Sir Keith. So, great story. Inferno. My favorite. One of my favorite Doctor Who episodes of all time. My favorite Perkwee story. So I want to know how you would rank all of these and what you think of my ranking. So comment down below and let me know. Other things to do, click the like button and the subscribe button and the bell for notifications. So you never miss out on another video. I also have a Patreon if you like what I do. And that helps me pay the bills as well. So if you would like to contribute to that, go ahead and check that out. I have a link to that down in the description below. I want to give a shout out to Colin Coney and Stephen Crane. I appreciate their continued support, two of my top tier patrons, as well as all of my other patrons like Alice and J.O.B. Who and Unknown Don't Trust the Numbers and all of the others as well. I appreciate every single one of you. Trevor, thank you very much. I also have a uh, P.O. box if there's anything you would like to send me. That's down there as well as is a link to my Amazon wish list and my Amazon UK wish list. Most importantly though, thank you for watching. <laughs>